Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to College Park, everyone in person, everyone joining us online. My name is Jason. I'm one of the pastors here at College Park. Welcome to everyone. If today is your first day at College Park, or maybe you're new to College Park, we would encourage you to grab that Connect card out of the seat pocket in front of you and fill that out. Let us know who you are. If you have any questions about College Park or any prayer requests, feel free to write those on the back of that card. And because you're our guest, we don't expect you to contribute to our offering. Uh, that can be your gift to us today is that Connect card. And we have offering boxes in a few places around the, the both lobbies and in the balcony. And that can be your gift to us today. We'd love to meet you, learn your name, how we can be praying for you, answer your questions about the church. Well, church, we really have just uh, one focus on our announcement portion this morning. Uh, well, actually two, sorry. Um, everyone has been very generous to this giving generosity uh, effort that we've had here in July, sponsored by our women's ministry. Our giving tree is still in the lobby. There's only a couple items left on that tree. Um, and what we're doing is our women's ministry said, you know what, there's a lot of uh, people in the church who have needs throughout the year. This is a way for us to bless them after maybe the baby has been born or they've had a surgery and they can't work for a little bit. And so this is a way for our women's ministry to bless the people of the church. So there's a couple things left. Who's going to help us finish this effort of generosity? We encourage you to participate in that. The other thing we have coming up here in August is our outdoor baptism service. We're excited about going out to the rallies property out there. They have a pond that we're going to use to do some baptisms. We already have some brothers and sisters who are planning on participating in that way. And if you're someone who maybe you've been following the Lord for a while, but you have yet to be baptized, we want to encourage you to really be prayerful about that and participate in that. Baptism is an act of faith and obedience that believers are called to. We're not saved by it, but those who do name Jesus as our Savior and Lord, this is a way that Jesus gave us himself to respond to him, to the grace and mercy that he has shown us. So we encourage you to really be prayerful about that. If you have questions about it, you want to find out more, we have the baptism class on August 8th. You can see the time on the screen. We have one for our younger ones, for our children, and we have another class at the same time for our youth ministry ages and up. And if you can't attend that class, please don't be reluctant to reach out to me, one of our elders. We'd love to uh, talk to you about that, about that decision in your life. And also attending the class doesn't commit you to baptism. It's a way for you to explore it though and prepare for it should you decide to do it. Well, church, let's stand up together and I uh, believe um, you're gonna call us to worship today or am I praying? You're praying? Celeste, uh, okay, I'll pray and then Celeste will lead us into the service. God, thank you for our time together today. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us the freedom, the space, the time to come before you as your people. We thank you for drawing us together. And we pray this morning, Lord, that you would help us by your spirit as we seek to enter your presence together. Lord, help us. We need your help today as we proclaim your goodness, as we uh, recognize your glory in our lives. And we come before you bringing all of who we are, our joys, our hurts, our sorrows, our gladness, God. May we bring that before you today as we worship you in spirit and truth. And may you be honored in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. My name's Celeste, and I'm going to be leading you guys in worship this morning with this wonderful team. I'm going to start us off in worship uh, from a passage in 2 Chronicles. I'm going to be specifically focusing on verse 15, but I'm going to give some context for that first. So King Jehoshaphat is up against the Moabites and the Ammonites, and they're coming to attack him, and he's not sure why, and he's pretty scared. So he asks God in an assembly. He gathers all the people and he reminds the Lord of his promises, that he was good, that he was faithful to all these people before, and he's asking him to be faithful now. So further down the line, in verse 14, it says that the spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, in this whole assembly. And he stood in the assembly and said what it says in first, verse 15. It says, listen, king, Jehoshaphat, to all who live in Judah and Jerusalem. This is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or be discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So God not only fights battles in Bible times, he fights battles in our lives today. So let's sing about his goodness and how he fights our battles, how it's not us who fights those battles, but through him, we have this power. Let's sing this morning together.
only for you. For the cross that you bore and the debt that you pay for the victory you won over death and the grave. This is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me. This is the reason I sing. So good, so good, you're so good to me. Forever I'll sing, you're so good to me. debt that you pay for the victory you want over death and the grave hey. this is the reason I sing for the hope that you give and the joy that you bring for the promise that heaven is waiting for me this is the reason I sing for the cross that you bore and the debt that you pay for the victory over death and the grave oh, This is the reason I sing With the hope that you give And the joy that you bring With the promise that heaven is waiting for me This is the reason Did he get saved or did he get smited? Who knows? So, later down in the chapter, in verse 20, it says, Early in the morning they left in the desert of Tekoa, and they set out, and they decided to go there and face the armies. And so in verse 21, it says, After consulting the, with the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord, and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness as they went out at the head of the army saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. And then in verse 22, it says, they began to sing as they began to sing and praise. The Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and they were completely defeated. So if we sing praise to the Lord, he comes, he shows up. So because of our reaction to his goodness and our reaction to all of his promises being fulfilled. If we react in worship and we react in praise, God shows up and that's just amazing. So in response, we're going to be singing King of Kings. And so we sang about the battle belonging to God. And so this is our response to him. He is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is above all and he is faithful. So let's sing that to him this morning.
grace and mercy poured out, constant patience and understanding and compassion. And we praise you this day for your love for us, for your love for your people, shown mightily in the sacrifice of your son on the cross all those years ago today, no less powerful in our time today, now, in your people, in your church. And so God, we praise you, our King of kings. And we love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, you can be seated as our children are dismissed to their classes. We have a, uh, let's hold off on the video real quick. I meant to mention at our welcome time today that we have a special treat today. We have a lot of extra bird saws around this weekend. Yeah, a lot of them right here. So we're blessed to have two of them be part of our service today. The first is Brian. Where are you, brother? Brian, why don't you come on up? Brian, is a, a, he's a missionary. We support a missionary in New York. He's going to tell you a little bit more about that. So we're excited to have Brian give us. And yeah, we're going to do the video. So we'll do the video in just a second. And then after Brian, his brother, Pastor Brent Birdsall, is here to preach to lead us through Philemon. So we're excited about that. So let's take a look at your video, and then you can give us an update on your ministry, brother. Okay? Yeah. Hello from the 34th floor roof deck of 222 East 44th Street. And behind me you see the United Nations and the East River and then Queens, uh, Long Island City in the background behind that and some of the new high rises over there. Kathy and I spend our time in ministry at the United Nations, building relationships of trust with the diplomats from 193 countries from around the world. We build these relationships through various means and then over time we try to point them to the teachings of Jesus. That's what we do, and we love our life here in New York City. Well, it is great to be here again today. My name is Brian. I'm the younger brother, Brian Birdsaw. I'm the youngest of three brothers. I'm the youngest of four children. I actually have an older sister named Connie Potter sitting right there. just want to recognize Connie as the queen bee of the, of the, uh, of the family, the future matriarch of the extended clan. Uh, so Kathy and I lead the team at, at the Christian Embassy in New York City. And um, I think that video kind of said it all, and every word I say, every minute I speak is one less minute for Brent to speak, and I'm really looking forward to what he has to say about Philemon, so I'll keep this really brief. Uh, we, we have a little slogan at the Christian Embassy uh, that says, the most influential people in society are often among the least reached. And I believe that's true. There's not a whole lot of ministries competing for space at the United Nations. There really aren't. There's just a couple of us uh, there, and we, and we all know each other, and we get along. We, we are very collegial. But I'll say it again. The most influential people in society are often among the least reached. 
The United Nations is the world's premier multilateral diplomatic posting, and so it is, it is the top posting for a lot of diplomats in their entire career, either in Washington, D.C. or the United Nations. So we have the privilege of engaging with the cream of the crop of the world's diplomatic corps. Uh, many of the diplomats who come to New York City and work at the UN then go back to their countries and become ministers of foreign affairs, Supreme Court justices, or even, uh, even prime ministers. So um, it's just a phenomenal opportunity. We do the, the basic ministry of what you would expect a campus minister to do in campus ministry. Our campus, you know, Kathy and I started off in the campus ministry in the Northeast many, many, many years ago almost 40 years ago now for Kathy. She started at the age of 10. And um, <clears throat> anyway, we do win, build, and send is what Campus Crusade always talks about is what we, we claim to do. And that's what we attempt to do at the United Nations by reaching out and meeting every newly arriving diplomat soon after their arrival, taking their pulse spiritually, and trying to figure out what it is we have in our toolkit that can meet them at their point of spiritual need. Uh, for a lot of Christians, it's, uh, it's a Bible study. A lot, there's a lot of believing Christians who come to the UN, especially from sub-Saharan Africa, the Caribbean, and the Pacific Island nations. That's kind of the Bible belt of the globe right now, it seems. Uh, we actually have a lot of Muslim people who come to the Christian embassy and say, I wanna, I, you know, I'm here in New York, I'm in America, I want to learn about Christianity. I don't have the opportunity in my country. So Kathy leads Bible studies with the wives of diplomats, and you'll be interested to see a number of times we've got a, a room full of women wearing hijab, and it's, just, it's fascinating. Um, so also another thing we're doing uh, this year and giving more attention to is just trying to establish a global network of Christian embassies through um, our connections within Campus Crusade and then outside of Campus Crusade. Uh, we happen to have dip, uh, embassies in New York, Washington, D.C., Ottawa, Canada, London, England, Geneva, and Bern, Switzerland. And now we'd like to establish or expand that and work outside of our internal networks and go, go global and see how we can uh, have a network of embassies all around the world where we can pass off our contacts. You know, if, if a diplomat comes to New York and then they go to Singapore, we'd love to know who might be in Singapore uh, doing something similar. And so we're going to give some more attention to that in the years ahead. So we've been... Um, you know, I've been, I've been coming to College Park Church since the late 60s when we used to come back here for, for general conference. You know, we grew up over in Peoria, and we'd come here and uh, remember, I can remember clearly uh, C. Ray Miller's inauguration or installation service way, way, way back a long time ago. So we have a long-term friendship and relationship here with College Park. We spent three months here in 1995 living over at 660 Opal Street back when Roger and... and uh, Cindy and Mitch and Kara lived right across the street in the church office back when I was still a residence. So that was a wonderful memory where we, we really connected deeply with College Park that summer of, ni of 95. So um, thank you so for your partnership, your, your generous giving month after month, year after year. We really, really appreciate it. And we love the partnership. And we look forward to having, you know, we had Gary Dilly and his wife come out to an event a couple of years ago. We'd love to have a delegation from College Park come out uh, probably in 2022. We're really not going to do much this fall, unfortunately because of COVID, but uh, I'd love to have some of you come out next year. So um, we'll look forward to that. So um, trying to save a lot of time for, for, uh, for Brother Brent here. So I will uh, lead us in prayer as we anticipate us uh, going to the word and hearing from Pastor Brent. So Father God, we do thank you for this opportunity to be your ambassadors um, in New York and in Huntington and Minnesota and everywhere around the world. We thank you for uh, the fellowship of the saints ar around the world, and we thank you for uh, the opportunity to engage in believers, with believers, and also to engage with people who are curious about the claims of Christ at the United Nations. We thank you for this, this time now to hear from uh, Brother Brent as he takes us through Philemon. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It is so good to be here. Let me take a look here. Yeah, Bob and Carrie are in their spots. That's always the same spot. Rowley's in the front, making faces. Yeah, yeah, okay. Some things never change. Yeah, there's the Dyers back there, always second row from the back. Yeah, so it's good to see you. Who's in the balcony? Yeah, troublemakers usually. Yeah. Oh, 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 yeah, you're not a troublemaker. I'm sorry. I take that back. You know, it was 28 years ago we came here, and uh, I was in my late 30s. Uh, I have a daughter now that's 38, 
and uh, little Ike, where's Ike? Ike was three, and uh, it was a fun time. You know, we were excited about being here. I have this history with College Park, and it was just an absolute privilege. Um, so I could tell stories the whole time, but they did invite me to preach, so I'm going to go ahead and preach. But I was thinking actually of coming here 49 years ago when I was a 17-year-old high school graduate taking college classes for the first time and being introduced to some new areas of study. And I took a lot of interesting classes, but one that I particularly remembered, and it's been a, always a fascination with me since then, is the whole study of sociology. How does a society work? How are there interactions with, how do societies organize themselves? And I had experienced it as a kid growing up, but now I'm studying it as an academic inquiry. And so it was a really fascinating class. And one of the terms that I learned way back then, and I've always been kind of observing it, is what we call social stratification. The way in which society kind of organizes themselves according to a, a number of different factors. And some of those factors are actually wealth, or it might be education, we organize people according to race or gender or occupation or even age. And so we kind of put them in categories and boxes. And, and it does help for analysis, but some of that stratification also keeps people apart. And we hang out with those people like us, and we look at those people that are not like us, and sometimes we actually use the phrase, we demonize those that are in other categories. And so in the context of social stratification, I invite you to open your Bibles to Philemon. And this series is called In Short. And right now I have 22 minutes to be short. And I am going to give it my very best. Oh, actually, no, I have 27 minutes. So actually I have more time. So I'm going to take us through Philemon. I'm going to speed through it but I want to stop at certain spots just to help us not only understand the book, but I think there's a message for us today in how we can live and how we can apply it to our daily lives. Let's start Philemon chapter 1, or there's only one chapter, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, also to Apphia, our sister, and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your house. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, we know about, big, big name in Christianity. He had done three what we call missionary journeys, gone across what we call today Turkey, then it was called Asia Minor, went around the Aegean Sea, spent some time in Greece, and had planted a number of churches. He was, a, he was an important man in the church. He is now writing to a guy named Philemon. We know a little bit about him. We make a lot of educated guesses about who Philemon is. Uh, the other names, Apphia and Archippus, no clue. Everyone guesses. They think that maybe Apphia is Mrs. Philemon. Maybe that is. And maybe Archippus is... Philemon Jr., we don't know. Maybe they're all meeting in the same house church, but it's all speculation. But Paul, we know, this letter's written somewhere around 60 to 61 AD. It's called the prison epistle because there were four letters where Paul talks about being in chains. And so scholars guess, is, was, was he in prison in Caesarea? Was he in prison in Ephesus? Was he in prison in Rome? The guy was in jail all the time. So where was he in prison when he wrote these letters? The best guess is Rome. The best guess is 60 or 61. That's Paul. Let me show a picture here. You're going to love my graphics. <laughs> Paul is an apostle and he's a preacher. Philemon, look what it says about him in verses 4 through 7. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your two things, love for all his holy people and your faith in the Lord Jesus. So he, he has it right here. He has a vertical relationship of faith and he has a love relationship with those around him. Sounds like a pretty nice guy. It also says in verse 6, 
I pray that your partnership with us in the faith may be effective in deepening your understanding of every good thing we share for the sake of Christ. Your love has given me great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. I say about Philemon two things. He was a church leader. I use the word affluent because we're talking about social stratification. I say affluent for two reasons. He had a house big enough to invite people in for a church. So it was probably bigger than a normal house. And he also was a slave owner. So in society, how they stratified themselves, if you had a little bit of extra money and wanted to get ahead, a good way to do that was not to hire people, but to buy them. <laughs> and then they became your constant workers. So he was a good guy. And I love this last phrase where it says, he refreshed the hearts of the Lord's people. If you want to take a little side note, this is not the main note, this is a side note. Take this as a, a, a secondary text. Be refreshing to people when you encounter them. Make people feel like, oh, I love seeing them. Whether it's the smile or whether it's a word of encouragement or whatever else, refresh people when you encounter them. I had a friend, I'm not gonna give too much details because it's not a nice story, but his nickname, was instant depression. And this, the story was, if you, if you didn't feel bad, go see so-and-so, and, and then you'll start feeling bad because he always had a bad story to tell you. He always talked about things that weren't going well. He never worked towards solutions, and he was just sort of like, man, <laughs> I was feeling good, and then I met so-and-so. So don't be like that. Be like Philemon. Be refreshing to people when you encounter them. It's always a good thing. Now, we have these two guys. If you notice, notice my stature here a little bit, I have Paul a little bit higher. Maybe it's in my mind that he's more important. Uh, he had been leading the church for quite a long time. He had written these letters. People saw him as a, an important person. Philemon, he's important. Uh, he was a, a, a house church leader. Uh, he was there in the city of Colossae. Colossae. I gotta be really careful because there's an archeologist sitting right over there, so I gotta be really careful. Colossae used to be a big city, but by the first century AD, it had declined a little bit in its influence. And so therefore, uh, it wasn't a big town, it was a small town. The, the equivalent, I, I've done a little bit of research, the s biggest city in the s state of Indiana up until the Civil War was New Albany. How many of you know where New Albany is? It was the number one city right there on the Ohio River. Why was it big? Because it was on the river and they made steamboats. <laughs> when steamboats went out and the railroads came in, Indianapolis went up and New Albany went down. So Colossae was kind of like New Albany. It used to be a great city. Now it was just a kind of average city. Okay, that's the, that's the setting we have for Paul and Philemon. Now, here's the heart of the letter. Here's the request, verses 8 through 11. The object and the word is Paul's making an appeal. He says in verse 8, Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. It is not it is as none other than Paul, an old man, now a prisoner of Christ Jesus, that I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. Add the third part of the story, Onesimus, and notice that he's low down because on stratification, he's not very important in society. He's just a slave. And they actually <laughs> called him useless. So maybe he didn't carry his weight. I don't know. But anyways, what we know is that he once lived in the city of Colossae. He was a property of Philemon. And now all of a sudden, he's here in the city of Rome. And Paul uses these terms, kind of a spiritual term. I became his father. He became my son. So what we think that means is, is that Onesimus had a conversion experience. We don't know exactly how they got together. It may be that Onesimus was here and he said, 
I'm just going to go to a big city where I can blend in and hide and nobody's going to see me. Or maybe he made a beeline to Paul. I don't know why he went there, but they ran into each other. He says, he became my son while I was in chains, and he is very dear to me. So, you should have a line below useless and runaway and say, Paul's son. There was a change that took place in Onesimus somewhere there after he got to Rome and got in touch with Paul. Okay? Now, <clears throat> that's the object of the appeal. And now, the, the tone, I love the tone. Paul is a little bit more important in my mind than Philemon, but he says, I could tell you what to do, but I'm not. I could order you, I could be bold, but I'm going to try to, on the basis of love, persuade you. That's always a nicer thing too, isn't it? <laughs> Just a little tip on making friends, influencing people. Be nice to them. And uh, don't be a big bombastic boss telling them what to do. Okay? That's a, that's a, that's a second thing. That's for free. Now, here's, number, here's the next thing. What is Paul's response in verse 12? I am sending him who is my very heart, back to you, I would have liked to keep him so that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. But I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do would not seem forced but would be voluntary. There's that nice tone again. Paul was doing a very traditional thing for the first century. It might seem and not might, it is rather toxic to us to think that people owned people. But Paul is in Rome. I got a map here. I should show you the map. Paul is in Rome. There's Onesimus, now his spiritual son. Philemon's over there in Colossae, quite a long distance apart from each other. The other thing that we surmise is that for a slave to make it all the way from Colossae over to Rome, most likely he stole some property. Maybe he stole cash, maybe he stole an object, and then he sold it for cash so that he could make a trip. And so, back in Colossae, Philemon's ticked. He's saying, hey, I paid good money for you. You're supposed to be on my staff. And now he's over here in Rome hanging out with a big wig, the apostle Paul. But Paul is saying, you know what? I'm gonna do the right thing. You, Onesimus, belong to Philemon. You, you need to go back to Colossae. That's where we got to get you because that's where you belong. We would say, hey, he got away from the guy. Let them be free. But Paul oftentimes worked within the structure in which he lived. Even though he may not agree with it, he sent him back. But there was a revolutionary request that makes it all the difference in the world. Verses 15 through 17, and I have it here because we got to read it really slow. Perhaps the reason he, Onesimus, was separated from you, Philemon, for a little while was that you might have him back forever. Verse 16, get this, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave as a dear brother. He is very dear to me, but even dearer to you as a human, a fellow man, and a brother in Christ. The story that happened in that prison or that house arrest in Rome was that Onesimus was all of a sudden a different person. No longer useless, but now useful. Helping the Apostle Paul in his ministry for the gospel but he is now a brother in Christ. And Paul sends him back to his slave master and says, I want you to have him back, but things are all different now. No longer as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. If the dude walks back into your house as a slave owner, do you know what he was? He was, he was totally free to Beat the snot out of them. There were times when runaway slaves were actually killed. To make an example, don't you dare run away. And the apostle Paul said, take him back as a brother. 
It changes things completely. When our primary affiliation is with the Lord Jesus Christ, every other relationship changes. Social stratification gets thrown out the window in the kingdom of God. That's why this letter is so important. Oh, boy. Get where I'm going now. Okay, looking at the clock here. The kingdom of God challenges the status quo. The kingdom of God challenges power structures. And so in social stratification, if we find ourselves near the top, my warning to you today is be careful. Because that is man-made importance. Every year, I don't know why, I have this morbid fascination about looking at the world's richest people, Forbes list. I don't know why I look at it. But every time I see those names, and I don't want to just pick on anybody, but there's Gates up there, and there's Bezos, and who else is up there, Buffett and all of that thing. The first story that comes to my mind is Luke 16. <laughs> <laughs> the rich man and Lazarus. When they died, their roles completely re re changed. Here's the rich man that had everything. Here's Lazarus that had nothing. And when they died, they switched. And the thing that I always say is, we don't even know the rich guy's name. It seems that insignificant that he was so stinking rich that in the eyes of God, Lazarus somehow had put his faith in God, and when he died, he was welcomed to Abraham's bosom, and that's a good place to be. God, this is a warning that comes from 1 Peter chapter 5. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As I read 1 Peter 5 some time ago and had the opportunity to preach, uh, this has been haunting me for the last month. All of you, clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. The reason why Philemon is so important is that <laughs> the Apostle Paul made a major attack on the institution of slavery there in the heart of the Roman Empire. And he said to one man named Philemon, Philemon, take your slave back. But then it says in verse 17, if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. <laughs> no beating. No humiliation, but a great big hug, and let's have a feast together. Paul asked for the same treatment for himself as he asked for the runaway slave. And that changes everything. Now, 21st century, we had all kinds of problems in our country and around the world, but it just seems like... We have a lot of people who are huge self-promoters. They want to show that they're important. They try to get themselves out there nowadays at social media, and I'm still thoroughly entrenched in the 20th century, and I apologize for that. But there's all kinds of people that think they're important, and they want you to think that they're important, and they have all kinds of social media pushing them up, up, up. And the Bible tells me, <laughs> humble yourselves. Where are the humble people? That's the kind of things that God wants us to do is to humble ourselves, not promote ourselves. We have all kinds of huge churches that we as Americans are so proud of, and we got this laundry list of fallen leaders that promoted themselves, and then, oh, the book of Proverbs says that it sort of leads to a fall. Promote themselves. And it's like, how about humble leaders? How about people that actually look out for the welfare of others rather than themselves. 
It's the agenda of the group and not their agenda that's so important. Let me tell you three stories about guys that I had the privilege of knowing here at College Park Church. Some of you will know these folks. Some of you who are youngsters, maybe under 50, won't know these names. But um, anyhow, Ed Rausch. Uh, for the last three nights, my family, extended family, been down at Roush Hall. And if you know him, he was an eight-term congressman from this area. He was a graduate of Huntington College back in those days, Huntington University now. And he and my dad knew each other back when they were students uh, here at Huntington after World War II. And so I was kind of always proud of the fact that I knew a U.S. congressman. And when I was here... Uh, used to be college would go up to Fort Wayne with a bunch of kids and we'd walk back to Huntington. We called it a walkathon. It was a way to raise money. And Ed Rausch, as the local congressman, uh, would come to support his alma mater. And I remember walking alongside of him in 1973. And so, uh, you know, I'm just a youngster and he's a big guy. And I said, so, what do, you, what do you think about what's happening in Washington right now with Watergate? And he gave me an earful about how he didn't like Richard Nixon and how he thought he should be brought before committee and made to testify and all the other things. And I got the real quick impression, this guy's a Democrat. And so I go back to my dad on the phone and I said, Dad, I'm here at Huntington College. We're, we're United Brethren. Aren't we Republicans? <laughs> what's this guy doing being a Democrat? But... I came here as a pastor later on, and I got to know him not only as a congressman, but as a gentleman in the church, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I heard his story, and what I heard about his story was is that he came from very humble, very poor origins, and it was tough on him. And the U.S. government, under the administration of FDR, that's Franklin Delano Roosevelt to some of you, FDR all kinds of government programs brought his family out of poverty and allowed him to live a little bit better. And Ed Rausch thought the government does some good things. Now later on, a guy came to Washington named Ronald Reagan, and he said, the government's the problem. And so there's different political perspectives, and I think a lot of it comes from what you experience in life. But here at College Park, and here in the 4th District, are we still 4th District here? A Democrat was re representing a bunch of Republicans because he was such a nice guy and we were all united together in Christ Jesus. And he was a humble politician. And that is not an oxymoron. I actually knew him. He was a politician and he was humble. God give us more guys like Ed Roush. Second guy I had the privilege of knowing. And again, uh, right next door to Roush Hall is Baker Hall. And that's named after E. DeWitt Baker, president of this college for 16 years, from the 60s into the 70s. Very good man. Uh, again, also a very humble man. Uh, I came here in 1993, and I met this very loving, vibrant church, and I made an observation after being here for four months. I think we need two services. And uh, you would have thought that I would have said, let's worship the Antichrist. Uh, there was a lot of frowns. Uh, there was a lot of people saying, why would we do that? I mean, give me one good reason. And I thought, well, the chairs are all full, and there's people out there that need to come in here. And we're a very good traditional worship service, but there's people that like other types of worship. How about we have a classic service and a contemporary service? took me three years, but in 1996, we introduced the second service. And <laughs> this is a story I'll always remember. It's so small, but E. DeWitt Baker was in his pew next to his wife, coat and tie, first service, like he was all the time. And then we dismissed, and then people left, and more people came in, and we all wondered, what was it going to be like in the second service? This is our very first time. And as the second service was starting, E. DeWitt Baker comes down the street from where he lived, and he had a, a, a man with three small children 
that were neighbors of his, a little bit past his house, and he had invited him to church, thinking that he would like the second service, and E. DeWitt Baker was so radical, he took off his tie and unbuttoned his top button. Because he thought that that would make his neighbor feel a little bit more comfortable in this church. And I love the man for that because he was willing to cross over lines of stratification. The president of the university going to a guy's house and saying, will you come to my church? And I think from my memory, the guy wasn't hardly even a high school graduate. But that didn't matter to DeWitt Baker. Everyone needs the Lord. I don't follow lines of stratification for the gospel's sake. And there's one more story, and I have... Three and a half minutes to tell it. That's pretty good. How many of you, while you were here and I was pastor, attended a foot washing service? Oh, okay. There's a few of you. A very few. And that's what it was like back when I was pastor. And um, it was probably the least successful of my ventures. But um, people said... We need to do, on Monday, Thursday, a foot washing service. There's a lot of Christian traditions that do that. And so uh, I said, okay. And then they looked, well, you're a senior pastor, so you got to do it. So I'm sitting there thinking, I I have never led a foot washing service. So I go down to uh, East State Street Street, Church of God, Larry Taylor, a good buddy of mine. I said, how do you do foot washing? So he gave me a little lesson on how to do foot washing. You all gather in a big group. You read the scriptures. You sing a song. The ladies go to this room and the men go to this room. I think I did it maybe three times. I'm not sure. That part I'm not real clear on. I only have one memory. (laughs) And this is a powerful memory. There was a lady one time that came in and I didn't recognize her. But I thought, well, she's most welcome. She brought, looking at her and then looking at the little boys that she brought in tow, I'm guessing that they're grandsons. Not sure. Didn't know her. But then, because of social stratification, she went to a room with the ladies, and I was left with these little brats. I mean, boys. (laughs) And I go into the room. We give a few more instructions about foot washing. And the only person that I remember being in the room with me is Paul Michelson. And myself, Paul Michelson, and two little boys. And so we go ahead, and I give instructions, tell about how we're going to do it. And as soon as I kind of said, okay, Paul Michelson gets up, takes the pail of water, goes over, gets down on his hands and knees, and washes the feet of those little boys. And I'm saying to myself, this is all wrong. You, my friend, are a distinguished professor of history. You are a Fulbright scholar. Those little guys should be down there washing your feet. And then I realized I got suckered (laughs) because I was following the lines of social stratification. Little boys should serve the older. And here Paul followed the mandates of Jesus by humbling himself and washing the feet of little boys he had never met. That, my friends, is the picture of the gospel. Social stratification doesn't go away immediately. I know that. Next year, I'll probably still look at the list of Forbes' richest people. I don't know why I will, but I probably will. And they're still going to be filthy rich. But the gospel tells me that's not important. There is only one qualification that's important, and that is, are you a child of God. And when you have that relationship right, then guess what? Everyone else here is on the same plane with you, and you're all children of God. And Philemon was told, refresh the hearts of the saints. Folks, if you want one word, it's humility. The church... And God knows America needs a lot more humble people. I'm actually kind of getting sick and tired of proud people. They're making a mess of our country. 
They're making a mess of a lot of institutions because they push their agenda, and when they push their agenda, they demonize and they horribleize people on the other side of the divide and make them look like they're absolute animals. And it's just like <laughs> in the whole economy of God, with God as our king and Jesus as our savior, and the Holy Spirit of God living within us, we should start behaving towards other people in ways that follow the kingdom values rather than social stratification that we're taught from our society. That's the story. Now, if, and this is all kind of supposition, sorry Celeste, this is your piece of paper, if Philemon had gotten that letter from Paul and didn't like it, he could have thrown it away and we would have never known about the letter to Philemon. But the fact that we have it, that he kept it, means that he must have agreed to it. <laughs> and he, he must have accepted Onesimus back in his house. And then the very last request that Paul said is, prepare a room for me, because I would like to come and visit you shortly. And I'm just thinking, this is kind of, I'm making this stuff up, but it's sort of like, when I come to your house, I want to sleep in the same room and I want to eat at the same table where Onesimus ate. Because we're all brothers. There's not slave quarters in the back with dirt floors and no running water. This is all us brothers in Christ hanging out together. And that's the way it's supposed to be. Oh, I got one more picture and this is a good one. And then I'm done. We're all level. No big guy, no little guy. We're all there, all at the feet of Jesus, saying, my only importance is not my gender, not my education, not my occupation, not my wealth, not my race. Any of that stuff matters nothing when you face the Lord Jesus Christ. And he simply wants to know, were you humble enough to repent of your sins? Come before me, not only confessing your sins, receiving my forgiveness that you can't earn, but I give it as a gift, that is the only thing that matters. Friends, may God give you and me a whole lot of grace to be a lot more humble in the coming days and weeks. Let's pray. Lord God, you are so good. You are so merciful to us. We recognize that there's nothing in us that's really deserving of your attention, especially your love. But you shower it upon us, you pour it upon us, and I pray that as your grace spills into our life, may it spill from our life into the lives of others. Help us, Lord God, to be people of grace and mercy as we humble ourselves before you and look for your places of service in your kingdom. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, Pastor Brent. That was wonderful and emotional. And I can tell you love Jesus. And that's amazing. I love that. And I also love the story of Onesimus's redemption and his just giving his life to Christ. And so the next song we're going to sing together, which you guys can stand with us. Um, we're going to be singing Build My Life. And the reason I love that song so much is because in the bridge, it talks about how we will build our lives upon his love and how it's our firm foundation and we can put our trust in him. But we can't do that without recognizing that God helps us do those things. The only way we can get there is giving our lives over to him. And the only way we could do that was because he died on the cross for us. So in the verses, it talks about how he's worthy. He is the name above any other name. And I just think it's wonderful because Onesimus recognized that. And through that transition, he was then level with everybody else. And so we're all level with each other because of God's love that was poured out on us. So let's sing that to him and give it over to him. He's the one who did it all.
just the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me let's sing this to him sing this to Jesus Thank you for coming. We are so glad that you came this morning.